Just after midnight on May the 18th, 2010, somebody called Laszlo was logged into the online Bitcoin forum and posted a message offering 10,000 Bitcoins for a couple of pizzas. Somebody else quickly wrote, 10,000, that's a lot. You could get $41 for those on the exchange at the moment. Those 10,000 Bitcoins were trading for $150 million as of yesterday. Sometime this year, they might only be worth $41 again. But Bitcoin was made possible by the invention of the blockchain. And the blockchain seems likely to be important long after Bitcoin is only of historic interest. These two reports, one from the UK Government Office of Science and the other from the World Economic Forum, say that the blockchain is revolutionary. They say it could get rid of central banks, stock exchanges and other intermediaries and make it much quicker, safer and cheaper to buy and sell houses, to pay taxes, to trade and for overseas aid and greatly reduce fraud and corruption. I'm going to use the example of Bitcoin to illustrate how the blockchain can do these things because we all use money and because a worked example is a good way of illustrating the power of the underlying technology. The security of the blockchain depends on cryptography, so Bitcoin is called a cryptocurrency, and as we'll see, there are many others. And it became popular with criminals because it could be transferred almost anonymously. People, people say anonymously, that's not quite true. Uh, over the internet, um, criminals now prefer to use other cryptocurrencies such as Dash, which are in fact more anonymous than, than Bitcoin. And Bitcoin relies on digital fingerprints, digital signatures. So I want to explain those technologies as well so that you can see that the blockchain is built on strong foundations. Now, Bitcoin is money, but what's money? Money is a way of storing value and passing value around. Without money, all trading would be barter. Swapping something I have for something you have, my cow for your corn, my day's work for your fish. Money gives us a way of storing value and, and then using it later. But the value of money depends on trust. We need to have confidence that the money that we receive for something will be valued by somebody else when we want to spend it later. So somebody has to guarantee that the currency won't be made worthless by forgeries, for example, or by creating too much of, of the money and causing inflation. And that role for, for the cash that we use is the Bank of England's role, or for, for other countries, obviously, their own central banks. Forgeries are made as difficult as possible, and when a forgery becomes too prevalent, the coin or the, or the note is withdrawn from circulation, just as happened to the one pound coin in the UK fairly recently. We also trust cash because we can see that the person wanting to spend it really does have it. It's, it's physical, it's there. You can see that they haven't already spent it because they lose the power to spend it the moment that you gain it. But cash is obviously inconvenient for major transactions or for anything other than face-to-face -face transactions. So more and more we use electronic money, bank cards, for example. And they're trusted because their issuers are trusted and because they offer some guarantees. But credit and debit cards, therefore, have to have a, a central bank or a, a credit card company backing them, some authority that has power over the transactions. Um, for example, credit card companies take a percentage uh, and, of course, accumulate vast quantities of personal data on us all. Unlike bank cards, cash is private and uncontrollable. You can give me cash if you choose to do so, and no one can stop you or demand a percentage. If you only spend cash, you can be anonymous. Nobody needs to know who you are or where you are or what you've been buying. Payment by bank card, by credit card, by bank transfer are, are not anonymous. The transaction is recorded 
It can be stopped, it can be reversed, a percentage can be taken from it, it can be taxed. There are all kinds of implications of having a central controller. Criminals obviously want to use cash and governments are therefore trying to withdraw cash where they can and to move to a cashless economy. Not surprisingly, governments don't like cryptocurrencies and so we will see an increasing pressure on the cryptocurrencies because of the anonymity that they provide and the ease of transfer and the lack of control that, uh, that governments are able to exercise over them. Bitcoin was created precisely to create a currency that had the anonymity of cash and the convenience of bank cards without having to rely on trust. A currency that could be exchanged across the internet safely without any possibility of interference by governments or anyone else. And Bitcoin therefore needs these properties. They must be secure and unforgeable. It must be impossible to spend the same Bitcoin twice. Clearly you must be able to send them across the internet. And all these properties must be available without the need for a central authority or anyone else who has more power on the network or, or with the currency than any other individual has. So it all has to be created in a way that gives the people who use the currency, the Bitcoin, confidence in it without anybody having to give them that confidence. It must be a, a shared phenomenon. How can that be done? It, it sounds implausible. The, sovel, the, the solution was, was novel. And, and at first sight, it seemed completely impractical. But as we have seen, it worked. It involved keeping a universally available, unchangeable, unforgeable, indestructible record of every transaction with every Bitcoin from the time it was first created to the, last, to the most recent time that it, it was involved in a transaction without requiring the actual identity of any real person at any point in that process. And the blockchain is the ledger that records all those transactions, the entire history of every Bitcoin forever. The blockchain is therefore a distributed ledger because every user of Bitcoin is able to have an entire copy of that entire ledger. And if you can do that for Bitcoins, you can do it for anything. And that means that because you can do it for, for a Bitcoin, which is a, a digital currency, you can, you can do it for anything that you can represent in digital terms. Now, that means you can automate a lot of processes securely that can currently only be done manually and slowly and expensively. So before we look at the detailed implementation of the blockchain that makes that possible, I just want a, a quick uh, diversion into why the ability to have ledgers with that capability are so important. And it's, it's straightforward. I mean, ledgers have been at the heart of, of managing things and managing business throughout the history of mankind. It, it's a physical record of ownership and of transactions. And today, they're at the heart of business management, bookkeeping, accountancy, audit. The land registry is a, a register of all property and the transactions on it and the rights over it. Traditional ledgers, of course, have to have controllers and people who authenticate the transactions. Bank accounts, credit card transactions are held in ledgers. Um, passport control is done through ledgers. Wherever you look in a modern economy, you find ledgers. And what that means is that a way of managing ledgers without controllers could disrupt a lot of the processes in society. Disrupt improve, change in, in quite remarkable ways that are only really limited by the inventiveness of people seeing the power of this underlying technology. Now, 
You also, of course, need a way of creating your new currency. And that's what Bitcoin needed. It needed a, a mechanism for managing the ledgers and for creating Bitcoins in a way that everybody could see was fair and, and secure. And the way they did it was through the use of digital signatures and, and public key cryptography and hash functions. So let's have a, a quick look at, at how those work so that we can then use them in understanding how the blockchain works. Um, cryptography is the, the world of secret codes. The, the objective is to, to take any readable text, any string of, of characters or, or, or anything that can be represented that way, the plain text in, in cryptographic terms, and turn it into an unreadable sequence of, of characters <laughs> that can only be turned back into its original form by somebody who holds the secret key to the code. You may recognize the, the Caesar code wheel on the, on the top right. Um, some of you, you may be able to, to rapidly read the Freemasons code on, on the bottom right of, of this slide. But there are lots of, of uh, codes that are in use and have been in use. Um, Sir Thomas Gresham was using codes right back in the 16th century. Now, historically, all codes depend on a secret key. But this means that if Alice wants to send a coded message to Bob, they first have to exchange the key to the code, which has the disadvantage that their exchange of the key may be intercepted, or they may have to meet in order to exchange the key to the code. That's obviously a, a, a problem, particularly if you're trying to, to transact with somebody who's a long way away. And public key cryptography solves that problem. It uses two keys instead of one. And these keys are carefully designed so they have the remarkable property that any plain text that is encrypted with one of the pair of keys can be decrypted with the other one. Now, it can only be decrypted with the other one. And the remarkable property is that if you have one of the keys and as much of the encrypted text as you like, encrypted with either of the keys, you can't work out what the other key is. There isn't a way of regenerating the key that you don't have. That's done by some clever mathematics that depends on, on the known difficulty of factorizing extremely large numbers. We, we don't need to go into that, um, other than to, to say in passing that um, the difficulty of, of, um, use, of, of decoding something using public key crypto will be undermined once we've got uh, functioning uh, quantum computers. And there will be a lecture on quantum computing coming up in, in about... Uh, three or four weeks' time, I think. So, so look out for that. that. That should be really interesting. What this means is that, that given this pair of keys, Alice and Bob can communicate in secret without ever having to meet. They each generate their own pair of keys. And they keep one completely secret, their private key, and they publish the other one on the internet, linked to their email address, for example. So that anybody can have have their public key. When Alice or anyone else wants to send a secret message to Bob, they encrypt it with Bob's public key, knowing that only Bob will be able to read it, because only Bob has got his secret key, and that's the only key that will be able to read it. When Bob wants to reply to Alice, he encrypts a reply with her public key, knowing that only she will be able to read the message, because only she has access to her private key. So this works perfectly straightforwardly, it's freely available, it is extremely secure, uh, and, and you, can, you can download it and use it. I use the Enigmail add-in to my uh, email um, client, uh, the one I use is Thunderbird, uh, and all the magic is done automatically. There's the, the key generation, the finding public keys for other people and so on. Uh, is done by behind the scenes and, and all the encryption and decryption is done behind the scenes. So it, it's completely transparent and it makes it, as I say, very secure. It, it's actually a jolly good way of sending messages to yourself 
if you want to write down something that, you, that nobody else should be able to read because it ends up stored on your computer encrypted. The second trick that Bitcoin needs to use is hashing. And hashing is a, an operation that creates a digital fingerprint for anything that can be represented as a string of characters. It can take uh, a plain text, a, a string of text of an arbitrary length and create a, a short, fixed length, digital fingerprint through a one-way operation. It, it reduces the input to this short string of characters, which is essentially unique to the input string. You can't regenerate the input string from the hash, and it is practically impossible either to find another input string that hashes to the same value, uh, or to create a particular hash value that you want to create um, by, by knowing how to do it, because you know the hash function. So it, it's a one-way process that creates something that is, is a real fingerprint for a photograph or a, a, the complete works of Shakespeare, whatever you happen to want it to be. And as you can see from the example on this slide, if you make even a tiny change to the input, it makes a very big change to the hash. You can see how difficult it is therefore to, to create a hash that, that you wanted or to predict the hash function, the, the, the hash output that you're going to get. In, in this example, I've simply added a, a, a full stop to the input string and the resulting hash is completely different. Now, if we put those two things together, hashing and um, the, the encryption, public key crypto, what we end up with is digital signatures. Suppose you want to send somebody an email and sign it. You create an email, you generate its hash. You then send, you, you, you encrypt the hash with your private key and send the email and the encrypted hash to the person that is going to receive it. You don't bother to encrypt the email because you're not trying to hide the email, you're simply trying to sign it to prove that it came from you. When the person receives it, they regenerate the hash, decode the hash that you sent them using your public key and compare the two. If they're the same, they know two things. Firstly, they know that nobody has changed that email in transit, otherwise the hash would be different. And they know that it must have come from you because only you could have created that encrypted hash with, because only you know your private key and can therefore generate a hash that can be decrypted with your public key. So you've got a way of digitally signing a document with very strong proof that it, it hasn't been changed and that it has come from the person who says that, it, that, that they've sent it. And this is the way that a lot of software updates are, are sent out. They're signed by the software manufacturer in exactly this way. And, and the checking that they haven't been corrupted in transit and that they genuinely have come from the software manufacturer is done automatically by the software update mechanism to make sure that you're not, not um, uh, being tricked into, into updating your software with, with some Trojan or, or just something that's become corrupted over the, over the network. So, as we'll see, the way that Bitcoin uses the blockchain and the way that the blockchain is created is to use digital signatures based on the crypto and the hashing that we've been talking about. So, what is a Bitcoin, technically? Well, the acknowledged inventor of Bitcoin was Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, the name is believed to be a pseudonym. Nobody knows who it actually is. Um, there have been a number of claims, many of which have been shown to be false. Uh, nobody even knows how many people it is. Uh, and who, whoever he or they or she are, uh, they may actually be dead because the original um, Bitcoin wallet that uh, was set up 
by Nakoshi Sakamoto uh, at the beginning of Bitcoin uh, is now worth more than a billion dollars and has been inactive for many years. So um, if they're alive, they're, they're very rich and they have an awful lot of patience and an awful lot of confidence in the future of Bitcoin. <laughs> now, this is taken directly from Satoshi Nakamoto's original paper, which is, is available, freely available on the internet. Um, and as usual, all the references for all the things that I'm saying, you'll find in the transcript that you can pick up on the way out or, or which will be on, on the website in due course. So uh, you can follow up much more detail than I'm able to give you here in, in that way. And what he says is, we define an electric coin, an electronic coin, as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding these to the end of the chain. And the payee can then verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. So actually very simple. It is just digital signatures of the hash of the previous transaction so that you know that you're extending, that it's the same coin that you're carrying forward and, and that can't be corrupted, and the key of the next person so that they are able to show that they, they uh, do in fact own that coin when it comes to the next transaction. And it's, it's worth looking at this in the transcript and, and thinking about all the attacks, that, all the ways that you think it might go wrong to satisfy yourself that actually this, this does work, this is, this is secure uh, as defined. It provides two essential guarantees. By checking that the public key in the coin is able to decrypt the signed transaction and that the hashes match, we know the coin hasn't been forged and we know that it belongs to the owner of the public key and that therefore it's being given to us by the person who, who is claiming ownership of it. But that leaves one more question before we can accept the coin in payment. How can we tell that it hasn't been spent already without a central authority that can, can tell us that it hasn't been sent, spent already? We need to know because if I have a Bitcoin and I'm spending it over the internet, I could be spending it almost simultaneously in, in a, a dozen or a thousand different stores all at the same time. And all the transactions will look valid initially, but who now owns the Bitcoin? Satoshi Nakamoto's solution is that all the transactions must be published so that everybody has a copy of them on their, on their copy of the ledger. And that there must be a way in which the Bitcoin network can agree which of those transactions arrived first. And it doesn't actually matter which one they decide on because only that transaction will end up mattering. That means that when you're actually, as I'll come on to in a moment, when, when you're actually receiving a Bitcoin, you wait until the transaction has been accepted and is part of a growing chain. And the longer you wait, the more secure you are, actually. So typically, you'll, you'll wait until there are a few blocks ahead of, of, of your transaction block. And only at that point do you accept that the transaction is valid and, and you hand over whatever goods have been paid for. And anybody who has received a transaction um, that, that becomes invalid because another transaction on that coin has been accepted holds something that is worthless. They can't, they can't use it because it won't work in any future transactions. So how does that process of getting everybody to agree which transaction arrived first actually work? That's key technology at the heart of, of how Bitcoin works. And it works like this. If, imagine I'm, I'm spending a, a Bitcoin in an online shop. I send the proposed transaction to the Bitcoin network to verify. And lots of Bitcoin nodes compete to verify that transaction. 
Um, they're called Bitcoin miners. We'll come on to that analogy in just a moment. They compete to do it because they earn Bitcoins by being the first to succeed. And the verification involves building a block that contains the transaction and adding it onto the Bitcoin, onto the, the blockchain. Now, this is the structure of, of the blocks on the blockchain. The, the TX values here are individual transactions in this block. Um, there can be just one. Typically, there will be lots because uh, for efficiency reasons, you don't want to go through the cost and effort of creating a new block for a single transaction. We'll see just, just how difficult that is and why it's difficult in just a moment. Now, the value that's in there called the nonce stands for a, a number used once. It's a, it's a phenomenon that often turns up in, in uh, cryptography. It is just a completely arbitrary number. And I'll come back to what that's for and why it's so important in a moment. And the previous hash is a cryptographic hash of the previous block, and that's what joins the blocks onto the blockchain. It means that if you wanted to forge a bit of the blockchain, you'd have to forge every block after the block you were forging. And you'd never, unless you had an immense amount of computing power, you could never catch up with the speed that the blockchain's growing at. And that's where the security of the blockchain comes from. It's a cryptographic hash. In blockchain terms, it, it, it uses the, the SHA-256 hash function twice. So, the other thing you need to know is that the verifiers, when they're adding onto the blockchain, if they find that there are multiple versions of the blockchain around, they always just choose the longest one. And that means that if anybody tries to split the blockchain, the, the shorter chain just dies off because nobody's using it anymore. So that, that again, is a, a security protection against corruption of the blockchain. The security in the blockchain comes from the difficulty of creating a new block. It makes it extremely time consuming and costly to forge the blockchain because it is so hard to create a new block. It's deliberately made extremely hard because that's the heart of the security. To make it that difficult, the Bitcoin rules require that a valid hash has to have a particular format. It has to start with a specified, a minimum specified number of zeros. And since you can't predict how you're going to generate a, a hash, you can only do it by trial and error. And that's why it takes a long time. Um, the, the intention is that the uh, difficulty of creating blocks keeps up with the increasing power of computers that become available. So every now and again, the number of digits that are of zeros that are required at the front of the hash is increased to maintain the difficulty of generating uh, a hash with the appropriate values. The aim is to ensure that generating a new block takes about 10 minutes of computing on the fastest computers available. Um, and the idea is that only about 10 new blocks can be created in each hour. The requirement at the end of 2017 was for 17 leading zeros in the hash value. How do you, how do you create a block that's got that required hash value? Well, you change the nonce, and that's what it's there for. So you just increase the nonce one digit at a time, and you run the, the hashing function, and you keep doing it until, bingo, you actually hit a hash value that means that you have found, you've, you've discovered a new block, you have mined a new block, hence the, the minor analogy. And you include in that block an extra transaction that awards you 12 and a half bitcoins. And it's that that rewards you because, you know, that's a very significant amount of money in, in dollars. And consequently, it makes it worthwhile for people to buy 
whole server farms of, of computers and dedicate them to mining um, bitcoins. On, on average, it takes many trillions of attempts before you hit uh, a hash value that is, that is um, valid. And, and in Bitcoin terminology, this is called proof of work. This is verification by proof of work. And when they, when they found a block, an appropriate block, they broadcast it to, to the rest of, of the blockchain and verifiers immediately pick it up verify that it's a valid block by checking all the hashes and, and seeing that it, it connects properly, and then start using it as the start point for their next mining. Because if they don't use it, and the blockchain goes off in some other way, they will lose any effort that they put in to, to building on a, on, a different, um, uh, on a different starting position. So everybody's motivated to make sure they do, in fact, use the longest chain all the time. Otherwise, their work becomes wasted. The reward for creating a new block, uh, as I say, currently 12 and a half bitcoins, halves every 210,000 blocks that are created, which is about every, roughly every four years. Um, and because the only way of creating bitcoins is through this mining process and through these new bitcoins that are awarded to the miners who create new blocks, that means that the total number of bitcoins that can ever be created is finite because you're halving the number that are generated per block um, on a regular basis and therefore you've, you've got a converging series that ultimately comes out you're, there, there, there will never be more than about 21 million bitcoins so bitcoin is a, a currency that will not inflate in fact it's guaranteed to deflate because bitcoins will get lost Because there's that reducing incentive, transaction fees also been introduced in order to motivate miners to, to continue mining even as, as the reward for mining goes down. Uh, and you can pay more, and if you, if you offer to pay more, then the miners will pick up your transaction preferentially, and you will get your transaction verified faster um, than if you, you pay the minimum fee. Um, if you pay the minimum fee, you're typically waiting about 13 minutes at the moment for a, a transaction to be verified. You, you, because all of this is public, of course, because the blockchain is public, you can actually see um, how rapidly transactions are being verified and how many are being verified every second and, and from how many different um, wallets, how many, how many different uh, unique identifiers. All that information is graphed and published on the internet on websites. You can, you can see a huge amount of, of the data about exactly what's going on, on on the network, what the delays are, how much effort is going into the mining and so on. Uh, simply looking, looking online, and again, references in the transcript. Um, the delay goes up and down, of course, depending on the traffic and, and the work that the miners are doing. So. Um, there have been delays for as long as 15, uh, 45 minutes uh, at, at times during the past month. Now, a Bitcoin block is limited to a megabyte. And, and there's been some concern about that because it limits the number of transactions you can pack into a block and that creates some efficiency issues and, and so there's a constant discussion about whether to increase the block size but to do that requires that all the miners or at least a majority of the miners um, start using new software that accepts a, a different size and, and uses a different sized um, block and, and what that means is that you, you've created what's called a hard fork in the blockchain and that's highly controversial. Uh, there was, in fact, a, a hard fork in the Bitcoin blockchain back in last August to create BitCash, another um, digital currency that has spun off from, from Bitcoin uh, and is, is um, intended to be used for smaller transactions and is for, for, uh, with cheaper transaction costs and, and greater efficiency, a slightly different way of, of operating. Uh, but that fork was highly controversial, and as I say, it's created a completely new currency as a, as a consequence. So this is a, a simplified explanation of how Bitcoin works. 
um, much more detail in the transcript and in, in the references in the transcript. But the effect of these rules is that anybody trying to forge a Bitcoin transaction successfully would need to control more than half of the computing power on the Bitcoin network. Uh, even then, they wouldn't be guaranteed success. But to have any real chance of success, they'd need more than half of the computing power that's being used. Uh, it's said that half of the Bitcoin mining that is currently being done across the entire Bitcoin network is currently being done in China. So if you put those two facts together, it might coin that, uh, cause those of you who, who have some Bitcoins a few sleepless nights. Bitcoin's not the only cryptocurrency. Um, that's a table of, of the top 10 uh, as of June last year. Um, uh, Bitcoin at that time had a, a market capitalization, as you can see, of uh, once that 43 billion US dollars. Um, but Ethereum was, was up close to it, and, and then there was Ripple and Litecoin and, and various others, um, slightly, slightly less um, total capitalization. But a huge value. And there are um, many more cryptocurrencies um, than, than this. There are um, about a thousand cryptocurrencies at the moment. Um, those of you who read, read the Metro newspaper may have seen a, a story about um, Dogecoin uh, yesterday because uh, Dogecoin was, was invented by by somebody as a joke, as a, as a spoof takeoff of, of Bitcoin based on, uh, on, a, on a cartoon dog that, uh, that was very popular at the time they were doing it. Um, and, and Dogecoin total market capitalization. Um, Dogecoin is, is maintained by a, a bunch of, of part-time volunteers who, who just want to keep the joke going. Uh, the total, total market capitalization of Dogecoin yesterday passed a billion dollars. Um, and the different coins use different mechanisms for verification, have many different features. I'm sure you'll be profoundly relieved to know I don't plan to explain all of them. Um, but I will come back to Ethereum later because I want to talk about smart contracts in, in a moment. Now, the, the exchange rate between cryptocurrencies and, and traditional fiat currencies, uh, such as pounds and dollars, is set by supply and demand and can move erratically. Um, the value of a Bitcoin in US dollars rose tenfold in 2017. Uh, it rose about 40% between October and November last year and by 12% in one day while I was writing this talk. Um, and of, it does periodically drop uh, equally sharply and, and dramatically. Bitcoin has been likened to the mania for Dutch tulip bulbs that drove prices to absurd heights in the early 1600s before the price collapsed and ruined many people. Um, you, you've probably noticed advertisements on the London Underground now uh, encouraging travellers to invest in Bitcoin, which suggests to me that we're, we're reaching the peak of a, of a bubble. Um, it feels like speculative, like speculation to me. And, and new cryptocurrencies are being invented all the time, you know, really, really quite often. Their development is, is now very often funded by what is called an initial coin offering, a, a promise to the people who, who put the investment in to enable the, the um, software to be written to, to generate the, the new coin, um, a, a share of, of the first coins that are produced. Uh, and, and a lot of those um, ICOs, as they're called, initial coin offerings, uh, are announced every month. Um, a lot of the ones that are announced are fraudulent. All of them are highly speculative and, and high risk. So, um, you know, not, not for widows and orphans, please. Now... Satoshi Nakamoto chose to, to do the verification, as we've seen, through the proof of work consensus building. And that makes Bitcoin transactions um, almost completely anonymous. You can trace the history of every Bitcoin. So if you can identify um, 
one transaction with a particular person, that, that enables you to identify um, any other transaction that that wallet has carried out and, and therefore potentially that that person has carried out. So it's not completely anonymous. The, uh, the law enforcement agencies do some, some detailed um, big data analysis in order to, uh, to track down people and that's, that's one of the ways in which they broke the, uh, the Silk Road um, dark web um, trading website some, some way back. It makes Bitcoin free from interference, but it also makes the verification of transactions and, and individual transactions very expensive because of the enormous amount of computation that's needed to slow down the process of creating each block in order to make it secure. That's a, a, a graph of the Bitcoin network's energy usage to power the computers that are competing to verify the transactions. And of course, all but one of the attempts to, to verify a transaction will fail, because it's only the winner that gets, gets a reward. Everybody else's computation was wasted. The present electricity usage of the Bitcoin network is said to represent 1.4% of total world energy consumption, uh, about the same as Morocco. Um, each individual transaction takes about 260 kilowatt hours, which is more electricity than is used by an average American household in a week. Citibank has calculated the Bitcoin network will ultimately use as much electricity as Japan. Now, if we have an application that can use a cheaper form of verification, um, because it's, uh, it's a private blockchain that we're creating and we, we can have a, a central control or one or two trusted verifiers on the network so we don't need to use the proof of work approach, then we can actually get a lot of the benefits of the blockchain without having to expend this amount of, of energy in the process. And many companies are therefore building or considering private blockchains for use in their businesses. And so are organisations that already verify transactions. Major banks, for example, uh, the Land Registry, the Passport Office, have, have plans in train to, to use the blockchain. They can see the benefits that they would get from the blockchain security, the audit trail, the distributed ledger, and from the smart contracts that I'll come on to. And... and so let's, let's have a look at why those ideas seem to be exciting so many people about the power that this underlying technology could have to revolutionise business and, and parts of society. Uh, the, the blockchain is, is more than just a distributed database because it can eliminate the need for trust. Um, Mark Andreessen, um, famous venture capitalist and, and American software engineer of the internet, said the practical consequence of the invention of the blockchain is for the first time a way for one internet user to transfer a unique piece of digital property to another internet user in a way that the transfer is guaranteed to be safe and secure. Everyone knows that the transfer has taken place and nobody can challenge the legitimacy of the transfer. The consequences of this breakthrough are hard to overstate. And that's the key message from the power of the blockchain. It is transformative because it gives you the power to do something over the internet that there is no other technology that could provide those properties The World Economic Forum, the, the report that I mentioned earlier, talks about it having far-reaching economic and social implications. That it enables control over things like bribery because you can follow the money that you, or the transaction, whatever it is, a long way through the process if need be. It can lead to very extensive changes in supply chains. 
That report considers the invention of the blockchain to be as significant as the invention of the World Wide Web. Their argument is that the World Wide Web created uh, an, an internet of information, whereas what the blockchain invention does is to create an internet of value, and that that is so different that it's transformative, because real assets are then at stake. They say it affects much more than the financial services industry, which, of course, was, was their initial perspective. And they list here the fact that it can manage intellectual property, it can manage the, the awarding and verification of degrees, it can um, track anything that you can attach a, a digital identity to. Uh, and there are lots and lots of, of use cases that can be constructed for being able to transfer ownership of property that you can identify in this way with these um, properties of, of security, of um, transactions that can't be challenged because they, everybody knows they've happened and, and you can verify the fact that they were legitimate transactions. And they make the point that you can use this for anything that can be expressed in code. And of course, one thing that you can express in code is software. And it's perfectly possible to um, put executable programs onto the blockchain and to send them out to all, all the people who've got copies of the blockchain to run on their computers as, as they choose to do so. And one cryptocurrency has been particularly designed to make this as easy as possible, and that's Ethereum. Um, Ethereum, the, the application programming interface to Ethereum is designed to be Turing complete. So you can write a program that can do anything that you can, can write a program to do uh, using the, the interface in Ethereum. So Ethereum can carry any program. And that enables you to create smart contracts, transactions that will only execute when another transaction with particular properties arrives or when an external event is notified by a trusted source that enables um, some, some action to be taken. You, you can imagine um, that, um, to take a trivial example, that, that um, payment for a, for a delay on the railway uh, could very easily be implemented by a smart contract that was... was um, where, where the uh, transactions were created at the point where you, you bought a ticket, verified at the point where you actually used that ticket uh, to board the train and, and went, went through the gates onto the platform or, or got scanned by, a, um, by, by, by one of the platform attendants so that it, they, they know you're on the train. And then in the event that the train's late, a transaction is generated that says the train is, is late beyond this, this threshold and it automatically triggers a, a refund of whatever the, the contract says uh, to everybody who was actually on that train. Done automatically, no, no claim, claiming involved. Of course, you can implement that in other ways, but you've got a mechanism here that is designed to enable you to do that, and therefore you don't have to invent your own mechanism. But smart contracts are just software, and they can be wrong. And, and the the poster child example of, of this going wrong is the attack on, on the DAO, on the um, distributed, on the decentralized autonomous organization that was set up with, with a, a, a great block of, of ether of the Ethereum coins <laughs> to finance projects on, on Ethereum. Uh, and somebody noticed a, a flaw in the way the contract had been written that enabled them to extract um, significant amounts of, of ether from that contract on a regular, regular basis. And of course, be, because the, the blockchain is immutable, that's its, its nature, it's very hard to fix software bugs. Uh, the person who, who succeeded in, in stealing $55 million worth of, of ether has never been found. Um, the story of, of how that was spotted and what was done about it 
uh, and how it was finally stopped so that it didn't continue to happen is a wonderful detective story, really brilliantly written up, and it's available on, on the internet. I, I strongly recommend that you follow up the reference and the transcript and read it. It's a, it's a rattling good read, and, and it really does give you an insight into, into how, how all this stuff works. So, this is, is what the Government Office for Science said about the invention of the blockchain. And it, it gives some examples of uh, the kind of ways in which people are already using it. And, and the Government Office for Science um, report also gives some specific examples of, of um, government use cases that, that they recommend for, um, for blockchain, which they're, they're not actually in the report fleshed out in enough detail to be completely plausible, these, these use cases. But there's no doubt that Enough people are now working on implementing real business applications on the blockchain that the power of the blockchain is, is not hype. There is, there is a real capability here that can implement a, a lot of business functions in a revolutionary way, getting rid of the intermediaries. And, and that, of course, has its, has its consequences. Uh, will it change the way that, that we live and work? Well, I think it will, actually, um, for the reasons that I've spoken about, because it, it will help people to eliminate costs and, and to revolutionise business processes in, in ways that are really only limited by people's inventiveness. Um, they could be used to give individuals control over personal data, but I'm not very hopeful about that, because... There are too many commercial pressures to not give users control over their personal data, and I, I don't see that battle being won, even with GDPR uh, arriving, the General Data Protection Regulation coming in in, in just a few weeks' time now. Um, as usual, the, the people who introduce the new technology will be the winners, um, because they will eliminate the costs. The people who were the costs and get eliminated will be the losers. Uh, there is always this imbalance of power in the adoption of, of new technology, and this is just another example. I've talked about such, such issues in previous lectures. Uh, if Bitcoin continues the way it's going, it will change the way, way we live and work because it will accelerate climate change. And if all the other cryptocurrencies go down the same path, we'll, we'll run out of electricity. So uh, you know, <laughs> there is that potential impact anyway. And, and it's worth making the point that, that these technologies, because they all depend on software, um, they do depend on the software being right. Uh, there have been a lot of things going wrong already. Um, vulnerabilities in, in exchanges, um, Bit Bitcoin exchanges in particular, that have, have caused um, Bitcoins to be lost or to be stolen. Uh, there was a, a, a mistake made um, on, on the uh, Ethereum um, chain that, that caused a whole lot of people's wallets that, that held Ethereum Ether to be locked and, and locked away, I don't know, $17 million worth of, of Ether for an extended period until somebody managed to work out a way to fix it. There are, there are lots of issues of this type because it's just software and because, as, as we know from, from lots of lectures I've given, um, the quality of software that is written is not good enough yet for really, really critical applications in, in most cases. So, I conclude that there's going to be quite a lot of disruption uh, to surprisingly many businesses because intermediaries are, are everywhere and if you can find a way of taking them out, it does make a profound change and, and there's usually a good commercial reason why you'd want to do that. Cryptocurrencies, I think, will be around forever, and governments will try very, very hard to control them because they really undermine the ability of governments to govern. So there's a, a really strong tension there, 
Uh, and governments have got a lot of weapons they can use. They can, they can legislate against the exchanges, for example, that enable the, the cryptocurrencies to be turned into other currencies. And until you can use cryptocurrencies for everything you can use other currencies for, that would be quite a, um, an inhibition on, on the use of, of these currencies. I don't think Bitcoin will be the leading cryptocurrency. I, it's clear you're not going to need thousands. That would just be a nightmare. You, you don't even need very many. You probably actually only need one or two in the world if, if they're really going to be successful. And, and there's no good reason to think that just because Bitcoin was there first, it will actually be the winner. Uh, and you can see Ethereum coming up very, very hard behind because of the smart contract power that it's got, for example, and, and that encourages people to use it. But that has its weaknesses too. Because you can program anything on it, the, the law of the internet that says anything that can be programmed will very rapidly be used for, for sharing pictures of cats uh, turns out to be... Uh, exactly what happened to, to Ethereum. Somebody, somebody programmed um, toy kitties, cyber kitties, that you could share on the Ethereum blockchain. And, and for a while, uh, that was the major activity that the computers processing Ethereum were actually carrying out on the blockchain. It nearly took the entire network down. <laughs> so I end with the, the thought, this is yet another argument for, for yet stronger software engineering. So uh, that's, that's been a recurrent theme of a lot of my lectures, and I, I hope the message is sticking because it really is why I, why I decided to give this course of lectures. And uh, I'll give you some more examples in, in the remaining lectures that I have to give in, in, uh, in this academic year as to exactly why that's so important. Thank you very much. <laughs>